So, listeners, this is Andrew speaking. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> Mike, this is Don Carnage speaking to you with my voice. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Serious. <laughs> Jesus. This is Andrew Johnston, RDH, speaking to you right now. So glad you clarified that. Yes. It is this not is, Michelle Strange, It is RDH. not. Well, now it is also Michelle Strange <laughs> talking. But here's the thing. You guys have heard us talk about Smiles of Sea in the past. We might have gone on one of those cruises. And it was amazing. Mm-hmm. We had a great time. We had a great time. There was a lot of fun to be had. A lot of... CE to be had. CE to be had. A lot of networking and, mm-hmm. and friendships to yes. be formed. Yes. There's another one coming up. There is. In April. And it's Nurses Meet Hygienist. It is going to be amazing. Yes. So when we talk about the oral systemic link... Like this is going to be where you and get and trying a good to be a collaboration within the medical profession. Boom, it's yeah. on a boat. Yeah, it's on and a boat. So you get see, you get fun, you get a little vacation, get a little sun. Hopefully, you get your doctors to pay for it as well. It's in April, but if not, do it for yourself because you need to. You need to invest in you your education, and this is fun. Absolutely, but it will be at what April? April twenty eighth through the thirtieth. They're going to Bahamas. To the Bahamas, going out of, out of Miami. You go from Miami to the Bahamas. Mm-hmm. So three days: Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Right? Yep. Yep. Which is nice. It's um, not very expensive. No. Couldn't tell you the price right now because I can't think of it. But, but <laughs> well, that was a good one. Like we said at the same time, but. If you use a promo code mm-hmm. AJ for Andrew Johnston. AJ. Not MJ for Michael Jackson. Or MS for Michelle Strange. Yeah, don't or, use that. Because you won't get anything from that. <laughs> I almost said RBS for... I will shove that mic down your throat. Bologna is what I was going to say. <laughs> AJ, listeners, that's the one. AJ. You will get a discount. Very good. And yes. so... Go to the smilesatsea.com website mm-hmm. and register as soon as possible. As and soon I will as be possible. on I will be on the ship. It's Michelle questionable if I will be may there. or may not be there, but I'll bring my recording stuff. Yeah. So whether you want to just Mike, hang out. The manager. Mike be there. a tale of two hygienist manager, aka newly promoted Andrew's older brother. From lower assistant. <laughs> From the least of the least to now the best, to Mike the, will be there. The brains behind this operation, <laughs> he will be there. So I don't think he wants credit for that. By the way, what that he's to be the brains, brains of the operation? Because there are still no brains in this operation. Anyways, so listeners, yeah, yeah, we are. Mm-hmm. That's that's how we do it. So, listeners, go go register miles at sea dot com. Promo code AJ. Yes. Thanks. Bye, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast guy genist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Andrew, I really don't like daylight savings time. This is stupid, it's antiquated, and I want I would have voted for anybody who had fixed this and stopped it from happening. Are you a lover? <laughs> Hi, listeners. It's episode sixty five. <laughs> Hello, welcome. Okay. On Daylight Savings Day. <laughs> oh, I just got a message. <gasps> Can I just give a quick shout out to Angie Stone and say that she is selling her little water bottles oh, for yeah. her little high life water bottles and are, that are yes all all listeners. Have we started? I think we just whatever. I think so. And so everyone needs to <laughs> go and get one from her because high life is need amazing to do that too. and drink more water. I need to get one. So yeah. yeah everyone needs one. I need to drink so. more water, man. It's to traveling, though. If I don't travel and I'm here at home, I, it's not a problem. But when I'm on a plane and I'm not about to try to get out of the window aisle or the middle seat 47 times because I'm going to pee my pants, <laughs> just not going to do it. Um, so yeah. can we go back to the fact I freaking hate daylight savings daylight time? Daylight savings time. Okay. Let's, let's focus in on daylight savings time for just a minute. And then tell me why. Why did it ever start? No, I know why it started. Why is it still a thing? I don't know why daylight savings happened. Or or I do know why, but I don't really care. But, you know, what we could do mm. is just move to, like, Arizona. 
Well, well and that's what's so it. stupid. How is one state, and now, and I'm not saying that I, I want to be more like Arizona, but why one state? I can't keep track. In Hawaii, too, right? Is it Hawaii? Hmm. And there's parts of, I don't know, I don't know all a little bit, but I, I saw a map this week of like the whole world, like where Australia does it, but parts of like China doesn't or something like that. That and shouldn't like all be these allowed. Different areas In what way does that make do sense? Do all of it or some of it or none of it? I don't know. I'm sure it had a, a use for things back in the day. That, well, it did. And I then everybody know, else, the to, smart like, people decided that uh, that's antiquated and we don't need it anymore. And so they got rid of it. And then the rest of us kind of just went with, well, it's always been that way. Which makes me what you love. I hate it. They, and like, it's kind of, I think it's a lot like, like the electoral college. Like there was a way, a reason for it, but now that there's a way to do popular vote in a very systematic yeah. and efficient way, I feel like, um, there's, yeah, people just aren't up with the times. We just need to, stealing from Daniel Lopez, we just wait for all the old people <laughs> to die off so we can make get young changes. blood in there to make better decisions. So. Yeah. I don't know. Does it throw you off? Does it throw you off? Yeah. Or do you just hate yeah. the fact that you have to, or do you just hate having to like reset your clocks? Well, I like right now, like the staying lighter longer. Like if mm. it could just stay like that and let nature take its course and when it gets winter, it gets darker and that's just what it is. And then it comes back around. Like I'm fine with this time right now. Yeah. It never changed. What if I just stopped doing it and just like live my own life in my own time? <laughs> you'd be late for a lot of your webinars and you'd be late for Most. a lot of other <laughs> meetings. But it's so confusing when I go to do webinars in other states. I'm like, I don't, I'm like, what, what time is it right now where you are? Tell me what time it is where you are and then I'll figure out what time I need to show up for my webinar. <laughs> so on on the path of things Michelle hates, including daylight savings time. I want to rewrite the driver's license test. Like I I want to be in charge of that. And I want the first question to be about how you drive on the interstate. And if it's going to be essay. And if you say anything about staying your happy ass in the left lane, you immediately fail. You do not pass go. You do not get a $200. You do not get a driver's license. I, I I'm very I feel like there's a story behind all this because I just had to drive to uh, Florida, and I fly for a reason. So I will say Washington State is notoriously bad about hanging out in the left lane from about Seattle to Olympia. The rest of the time, just there. Yeah, like, I don't know. Like, I drive up and down the I-5 corridor from Portland to Bellingham pretty regularly. And I'm always the most frustrated between those two areas. Now, traffic is heavier there. And even if it's 8 o'clock at night and I'm coming from Seattle down, there will be people hanging out in the left lane going exactly the speed limit. And that just bothers me. Not that they're going oh the speed God. limit, but it's like, move over because I'm, I want to break the law. So let me go faster than you. Again, there it, sh- it should be pass fail. If you do not even get that answer right, you cannot go on for the rest of the test. But they're going to lie better about in that, life. Michelle. Mm, it's not how all do you right, beat man. That? How do you beat that law? You gotta, you gotta blow no, out their I, tires when I pass them. I will. You know, in uh, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, um, there are are law enforcement officers and stuff here that do pull people over if you're going too slow. Because our law really? is you have to move over to the right. Yeah. Unless you're, you have to be, only reason you're supposed to be in the left lane is to pass. And so if you're not passing somebody, then you'll get, you can get pulled over. Mm-hmm. So I'm not real all that happy with law enforcement officers at the moment. They gave well, me a speeding you ticket. I'm going to tell you, screw you, then I'll just throw it out there. I, I love them. I love them a lot. Yeah, have- they have a hard job to do. They're they a do. lot like Dennis. You know, let me rephrase People that. Hate them. I'm not happy with backwoods, little town law officers or DOT that makes their speed limits a speed trap. I got problems with you. 
So did they slow down ticket. the speed limit because it's a there rural area? There are three area, different I mean. speed limits that change and fluctuate within a 10-mile radius about four times. Hmm. So hmm. it might start at 64, then it goes to 45, then it goes to 55, then it goes to 45, then it goes to 65, and then it goes back down to 45. Hmm. Within a 10-mile radius. Sounds so like you didn't if, pay attention while you're driving through there, Michelle. Yeah, well, I was looking at my GPS. That was my fault. But when I got to the look, I, was, I went to University of Florida um, and did a presentation with ITI, which is a, an implant, international implant um, kind of institute. And those are, they're real high level guys. They're great. Everybody I met, all the dentists were just super smart. Um, but I got there and they asked me after my presentation, like, how long you were, how, how many hours were you driving today? I was like, almost five. I would have gotten here sooner, but I got a speeding ticket. And they're like, oh, was it in Stark? Was it in Stark? And I was like, yeah, I think that's where it was. They're like, (laughs) ah, Stark got another one. You're one of the crew now. Like, if you have a speeding ticket from Stark, you're one of us. (laughs) And I was like, those bastards. I knew they did this. That's not nice. I knew it. Oh, I was so mad. And it was $200 and three points on my license. Um, Tell me about the points on the license thing. I'm not really familiar with that. Oh, have you never had a speeding ticket? I have, but I don't I don't remember them having points off of my license or anything. Um, I think so for each type of ticket that you get, it's a certain amount of points. And I I mean, mm, I have to think back, but I think it's 12 points that you have, and if you lose 12 points, you lose your license. Um, it might be just South Carolina's 12, I don't know, but <laughs> this was it's definitely three points because I had six at one point and I was like, oh, 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 shit, I might need to go take one of those classes. I know this Man, is a really I'm stupid thing you. to say, but mm-hmm. like, I don't, I honestly, I, this is a whole um, state or nationwide thing. This is a, probably a great thing to ask the Google machine. I'll have I, to do that. I thought it was on. nationwide. I thought it was nationwide uh, because, I, like I said, I was real close. I was like at six points and. I was like, maybe, because when I speed, I do it well. I was definitely getting some speeding tickets there for a little bit. Again, this is why I fly. All right, so Wikipedia says, the point system is applied in different ways or not at all in different states. (sighs) So, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that we don't have them in Washington. I just, I don't see them on the list because there's California, Colorado, Florida, New York, North Carolina, Texas, Massachusetts, Ohio. Um, there's some other ones on there too. I, I don't know. Maybe I'll have to look that up, but that's interesting. Interesting to know. I'm being mentioned on Facebook, which makes me always nervous. Because you did people. something wrong. I've been extremely active in my frustrations on Facebook this past week. <laughs> I should just learn to shut my mouth, really and truly. I, hey, I don't know if I told you this, by the way. This is probably mm. a good. You know how, like, I know how you love surprises. Um, <laughs> we are ambassadors for Under One Roof now. Are we now? We are. And so what that means, basically, is we have a promo code that people can use um, to register for Under One Roof. And our promo code is love U O R five love under one roof and then the number five all together and i'll put that in the show notes too but um i think it's i think there might be something like we might get something for it i'm not really for sure i just saw it on one of the um the newsletters that come out and i'm like hey can we do that and they said yes i said okay sounds great because you and I talked about that at the beginning of the year about how it's one of our favorite conferences. So yeah. it would be great to see people out there. Totally. Absolutely. Yeah. So, all right. What do I have to be an ambassador? Uh, yeah. I what mean, does that it's mean? just not that nothing. I don't mind. Just, I just don't know what I just tell me what I got to do. We'll let's talk know, about it on the podcast you know every now and again. Busy meeting for me. And now I'm just oh, yeah. speaking, I'm doing a hands on course for a piezo. Uh, scaler. Oh, you are. Yep. You are. Okay, I am. then. Uh, I forget. I think it's 
Friday morning at 8 a.m. It's whatever. It's before the exhibit's open. So. Well, that sounds early. So we'll see if I can wake up early enough to go visit Yeah, so I'm testing out a new uh, piezo unit, which I'm really excited about. You're testing it now or you're testing it out in front of everybody? I'm testing it now. Like, I'm using it. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, guess what I'm going to be doing? I'm so excited. You know, in my spare time. My, you know, my many hours of spare time. Um, Your half hour a week of spare time. I found a clinic that is a volunteer clinic. Volunteer. Oh, shit. I've drank wine. And here comes the word problems. (laughs) I volunteer there. Uh, It's called Our Lady of Mercy. And, um... I'm going to go and volunteer, and then they'll let me um, kind of make my own schedule. I can come and go as I need. I can work as many hours or as few hours as I can, and then I can bring mm. all the things that people give to me to t- try. I can take all the oh, clinical nice. photos I want. I can do all the videos I want. They can get, they'll give me as many hours. If I want an hour and a half for a profi, they'll give it to me yeah. if I just oh, because I'm awesome. trying stuff. I literally wanted to like jump up and down and hug the guy who was like, sure, that works. No, you're, that sounds great. Sounds like all the things you want to bring to us is going to be something good for patient care. So that's great. And I was like, really? <laughs> I could call you like next week and be like, you got anything Thursday? And you would just let me come and see patients and do my thing? And he's like, yeah, sure. I was like, this is heaven. That's so good. So I'm excited because... A, I do want something like that, though, because right? you're right. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can get out of it. I mean, it's a very much a two-way street. They benefit from you being able to see patients, and then you benefit from getting all the... I think clinical photos are gold. I mean, it's hard to take clinical photos, yeah. especially in, you know, like a corporate setting or, you know, certain settings because, you know, the dentist doesn't want it or they're going to be solely the property of the practice and you don't get to use them for your you know lectures or education but no that's really awesome that's a pretty good deal on both ends i think i'm so excited because i'm not maybe it, this could be all in my head but you know now that i am not practicing um i guess technically i mean even though i don't feel like i'm not practicing because i'm in the clinic with students and you know they yeah. i have four students each uh, like morning and then four in the afternoon and they each will see patients in that time slot and I'm seeing patients with them. So they, I, I check them, I assess them, I teach them to scale like SRP kind of style, advanced instrumentation, perio implants. If anybody has implants, they call me over for consult. If uh, you, I'm, I'm seeing them all. So I don't, I feel mm-hmm. like I'm still in clinical, but I will tell you, since I have left clinic, clinical and I'm doing this, I'm, I think I'm shamed a little bit for not being a clinician anymore. Do you think that that's a lot of your own shaming of yourself or do you think that other people are shaming you? It's, it's more of a, uh, oh, so you're still practicing? I'm like, well, no. Oh. Yeah. So now you have to feel like you have to justify, justify the fact that, that I, you know what's yeah. going on. Yeah. yeah. So I'm excited that I can. I can I, see that. Yeah. See, and that's, that's really, it, I kind of feel very torn because I understand what, what, how they feel like, oh, well, you're not actually in it every day. So you wouldn't know the, uh-huh. what I'm talking about. But at the same time, like now that I am doing this, I wouldn't be able to have this schedule if I was practicing as a clinician. There's just mm-hmm. no way. Mm-hmm. And right. honestly, if I'm doing it once a month, like some people are doing, like they're they're doing what I'm doing, but they're practicing one time a month. Is that really even anything? Like, I, yeah. I don't know. And I, and I think that there's uh, there's something else that would be said about what you do that uh, just like the knowledge and stuff that you gain by listening to other people and traveling around and doing your own research and doing all of those things that I think that actually does probably make you a better clinician than most, just like, you know, people listening to the podcast when we bring on these guests that are awesome. Well, we, we don't right. actually do what they do, but we take their knowledge and we try and apply it to our practice. So even if you are practicing once a month or, you know, with your students or whatever, then, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, I still feel like you're, your your finger is still on the pulse of the profession, and yeah. I, I still feel like you're qualified to speak on it. 
I, don't, I mean, it could be my own thing. I'm not trying to give you kudos or make you feel good about yourself. Please don't. You know, that's not what I do. I don't but. like when you're giving me compliments and you're nice to me. It <laughs> makes me feel weir- really weird. It's very hard. Don't do it. Um, can I tell you, though, I, I, I have been feeling really good the last couple of weeks. Um, kind of like creepy, weird, kind of good. I asked Allison today if she was slipping me drugs or something. Or <laughs> Are some you sort getting of a Xanax every now and again? Antidepressant or something. <laughs> I, she, I thought she would be, but... I am feeling just really appreciative and oh, like right. full of love and excitement. You must be because I don't you know. sent me a really nice text message and I was like, don't ever give me a compliment again, Andrew. I don't like it. I don't it. think that that ever happened. That, you don't have any proof of that happening. <laughs> I do I don't, have. I That's do that. the thing about text messages. They're there. No. Oh, I sent you a present too. You, what oh, the crap. You really did. Oh, I need to take a picture of that. I'm going to wear it. Dude, that was... It's a t-shirt that said, we didn't suck in 2016. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I saw it, and I just loved it so much because I'm thinking about us in the podcast, and I'm just like, we we didn't didn't suck. suck. Like, we... (laughs) It could have been worse. (laughs) And so I'm like, yay. Um, I just... I had to send that to you. It was so funny. I opened it, and I was like... um, That's when I texted you. I was like... Explain to me what I just got in the mail. <laughs> what this is. <laughs> we didn't oh, suck. Oh, man, that's funny. All right. No, you I just, did. Yeah, so. I don't what do know. you I think was the really turning point? I of everything. Why? Like, what, what did it? When did you start mm, noticing it? I think, honestly, I think it went back to the Dad Genist episode with, oh. on the Mom Genist podcast. I think is when I started, no, like, trying to do a little bit more self-reflection. And then really, I think Chicago at uh, midwinter, I think just seeing people, meeting people, I feel really accomplished now where before I kind of felt that we were just kind of, I don't want to say faking it, but like, uh, we're still faking it. It's, it's us. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't know, but like, it was really nice. Like I feel really good about like us and what we're doing. And I feel like, it's nice that we've gotten all these emails and and things from everyone and these private messages over the, this last year and a half or whatever. But I think I never really realized maybe kind of the reach and it was really nice to see everyone like want to hang out with us and do all those things. I I don't know. I'm just, my heart's, I don't know, being stupid, I guess. No, that's awesome. What are you talking about? I agree. I know. I just, just, I just, Ugh. Um, I mean, I mean, I'll turn. I'll, I'll turn back to being the the, no. the, the hard-hearted harbinger of haggis. <laughs> Jesus. Christ. Sorry that that was from. So I married an axe murder, but um, well, yeah. But I don't know. So that was fun. Interview. And, and our, our, our episodes are good. Yeah, they are great. Your interview with, on Mom Jenna's podcast was really great, though. Like, if y'all haven't, like, audience, job. if you haven't listened to that, check out Mom Genist podcast and then look for Andrew. Andrew's been on there. Carrie, our friend Carrie Ibbotson, our friend um, Melissa. Mm. And Melissa, I, I want to say your name, but I'm going to freak it up every darn time. Oh, but, oh, say it, Andrew. I like how you said freak it up <laughs> yeah, freak so it. that I wouldn't have to go back and, like, You're edit welcome. it later. So I um, really see, appreciate it. See, I'm, so when I'm giving and then you give back, that's what's <laughs> going on. I appreciate that. You're, just You're out welcome. For me. You're welcome. But it's been a lot so. of good um, podcasts with Mom Jenna. So I agree. You're, mm-hmm. It was a good one. And mm-hmm. I could see where that would create um, a little self reflection. It's nice. Yeah. I mean, and, and I've been working like a dog, I'll be honest. I mean, I've been since Chicago, I mean, I haven't really had a whole day off. I've been either working in a clinic or traveling to an office or whatever. I think I did, you know, close to 70 hours last week. And yeah. actually I just got called off for tomorrow. I was, I was going to have to travel. What are you going to do um, with your day off? It was, I don't know. So maybe that's why I'm so happy too, is I get an extra day off. Do and some meditation. I have a lot of other stuff I have to do too, but I have to get some invoices and stuff done and blah, blah, blah. Oh, but. that reminds me. I got to do that. Crap. <laughs> Sorry. Dang Anyways, it. I'm also really excited because I listened to our episode for this week already, like it, just before we did our oh, thing. Oh, yeah. And Guys, get it ready. It was really good. I think I said 12 words the whole time. So be prepared, listeners, to not really hear me talk. Is that really different than our Dr. normal interviews? 
it was very obvious this time around that I was out of my depth. Yeah, I think I it was. I don't think so at all. I think you were just taking it in, as you should, because I, it was so great. Gosh, what a terrible podcast host if, as I'm just taking it in. But you know, you were asking really good questions and really good follow-up questions, and um, I have two pages of notes worth of stuff from them alone. And, and you know what's funny is it was two pages of notes where normally I take maybe half a page or right. a page. And theirs is only 35 minutes where everyone else is like 45 to an hour. And I'm just like, so I guess maybe we should say that is, hey, you guys need to not, I mean, you listen to it now, but go back and take notes on this interview because there's so many good things that you just can't keep it all in your brain. Yep. So So. to introduce our interview, it is um, Dr. Bradley Bale and Dr. Tom Larkin, um, Dr. Bale is an MD and Dr. Larkin is a dentist. And um, if you don't know them and their names or the Bale Donin method, or if you're not familiar with the American Academy of Oral Systemic Health, you you need to get there. Get get acquainted real quick. Hopefully this will mm-hmm. be a starting mm-hmm. point and you can then kind of follow up. I have the book uh, from Dr. Larkin. I'm free. It's for dentists, or I'm for, sorry, for patients. And it's all about dentistry and the oral systemic link. And then Dr. Bale has um, the uh, how to beat the heart attack gene. Is that what it is? Beat beat the heart attack gene. Beat yeah. the heart attack heart attack gene. So um, enjoy this podcast and this interview with Dr. Uh, Bale and Dr. Larkin. Hey, Michelle. Yeah. It's time for the interview. Oh, but I had something else to say. We need to let the experts talk now. Fine. So listeners, this is going to be an incredible interview. Um, We have Dr. Brad Bale and Tom Larkin here. And honestly, if you have not um, heard of AOSH or oral systemic health, um, this is going to probably blow your mind Mm -hmm. or just drop your jaw, like honestly, <laughs> in some cases. So um, a little background, I guess I was at AOSH um, and I heard right. you speak. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the things that we get really excited about is um, bloody prophies. Right. And how we have to stop that and why that even matters and what health actually looks like. Because it seems that health is... Oh, everyone bleeds. That's just a normal right. thing. <laughs> just a um, bleeding. It's only mm-hmm. perio if you have severe bone loss. Right. Um, it's a, a little bit of bleeding is fine. Everyone does it. It's almost like everyone has diabetes and everybody's obese, and that's norm. Like right. that's yeah. become our norm. And so we really want to shine a light on this. Right. And so tell us a little bit about okay. yourselves. Right. And why you're here to talk about the things you're sure. talking about. So I'll start. I met Dr. Bale in 2013 at, uh, at an AOSH meeting, American Academy of Oral Systemic Health. I think it was in Las Vegas. And at the time, I was a professor at the University of Kentucky College of Dentistry. And it just, by the time the morning was over, it was just a real pivot point for me because I had a whole new purpose. Um, I had a very unique private practice experience that began in 1989 and when I started doing bacterial risk assessment in my practice under the men- mentorship of Paul Kies, who was like, you know, the father of preventive dentistry as far as I'm concerned. So my both of my hygienists used a microscope with a, with a video screen. We looked at biofilms. You know, this is a long, long time ago. <laughs> and I saw the, the impact of a couple of things. <clears throat> I saw the impact of the visual, people seeing biofilms is, you know, I, I don't understand why even today that hasn't caught on, but it will yeah. because I'm working on it. <laughs> and and I understood um, biofilm management, and, and we were curing people, you know. And, but I, I didn't understand the oral systemic connection. So mm-hmm. when I was exposed to Dr. Bale and Dr. Donine, I said, I'm going to get back in the game because I see some real problems here. I see problems in semantics. I see people saying total health, complete health. You hear these words every day. Mm -hmm. No one knows what it is. I even had someone I heard on a, on a webinar, someone say, uh, that's taking blood pressure in the dental office, isn't it? I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Okay. The oral systemic connection is nothing about blood pressure. Okay. We're talking about bacterial infection. And so <clears throat> what I did was I set out to define it by creating a course. And, and the course ended up being a, a training dentist how to support a Bale Donine practitioner because I thought that's where this would go. So in the past six months, this has all kind of come together in a big way. Uh, Dr. Bruce Baird's partner was one of the first, he was the first person to buy my manual. And, and Bruce at the time was thinking about 
in, including this in the Productive Dentist Academy. So he reached out to me. He said, would you be interested in this? And then he, and then you spoke at one of his functions yeah. and it all came together. And so what we wanna do is we wanna take the lead, a leadership position in, in not only bringing physicians and dentists together in training, teaching, but um, help create this network and really push out this life-changing information. And so that's why when I heard about this podcast event, I said, I said, Brad, you know, would you be interested in getting in front of 50,000 people in one day? And he goes, yeah, that sounds interesting. And, and believe me, this, this event has surpassed my wildest dreams. As really? Far as, That's oh, so great. No, it's, it's, this is a, you know, this is a groundbreaking event. Yeah. Okay. And so, um, yeah, so that's that's kind of my story. Yeah, yeah, great. No, I think it is a groundbreaking event. It's kind of fun to hang around all these young people that are changing things. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's I it's love a different it. Different way we deliver and receive our information. Yeah, yeah. it's fantastic. It's but yeah, a little background on myself. I'm a medical provider, and about 17 years ago, my partner Amy Donine and I started devising a method to keep the arteries healthy. And she came up with the term arteriology, which I love, and it'll yeah. be in the medical dictionary. But we call ourselves arteriologists. We mm -hmm. study the wall of the artery and what's required to maintain the health of that artery. And if somebody's already diseased, what do we have to do to cause that disease to regress and stabilize? And we now have two papers published in peer-reviewed journals authored by other individuals that analyzed our data. One was with Texas Tech, the other with cardiologists out of Johns Hopkins, and their analysis clearly shows our method does halt, stabilize, and regress arterial disease. And it's really not all that hard to do. You just have to have a holistic approach, and one of the critical elements in that holistic approach is oral health. And certainly the high-risk periodontal pathogens are causal of arterial disease, and we just had that publication published in the highly revered British Medical Journal, the Postgraduate Medicine, that was published online. It's open access, so I would encourage any of your listeners to get yes. that article and that read it. That's the one that you sent yes. me, right? Yes. yes. I so those. I have it, so I yeah, can post it. It has good background to start out and how there's no question there is this oral systemic issue, and the germs definitely can seed out into the bloodstream, and not only the germs, but like endotoxins, like lipopolysaccharides. It's been known for a long time. But it was just recently that we were, were able to close the loop on all three of the essential elements to cause arterial disease with high-risk periodontal pathogens. And that was with a study published about a year ago with PG showing that causes a genetic transformation in contractile smooth muscle cells in the wall of the artery, which will migrate into the entomal layer where the cholesterol collects and those transformed smooth muscle cells create a substance called proteoglycans, mm -hmm. which is what traps the cholesterol in that layer. Because we, we already knew high-risk periodontal pathogens influence the concentration of the lipoproteins in the bloodstream, which is an essential element. And we already knew through numerous mechanisms, high-risk periodontal pathogens caused inflammation and dysfunction of the endothelium. So those are the three elements, the concentration of basically ApoB in the bloodstream, the health and wellness of the endothelium, the inside lining of the artery, and the ability to trap those cholesterol particles once they get through the endothelium in that wall of the artery, the intima. So when that last study was published with PG, it allowed us to create a publication, a paper stating that periodontal disease due to these high-risk pathogens is actually a contributory cause, cause. of no longer correlation for right. now it's disease causing. not right. just it's associated a it's a huge cause. deal right yeah so the periodontists that are taking care of periodontal disease due to high-risk pathogens which is the vast majority of periodontal disease certainly aggressive periodontal disease they're li literally saving lives 
And I'm not sure they're aware of that. I mean, their work is extremely important, and we have the highest regard for dental hygienists. Right. Because they're the ones really going in there and taking care of the problem. Right. And that Thank helps you. if they have yeah. a den dentist <laughs> who's supportive, and it also helps if the rest of the staff in the dental office is supportive as well. Absolutely. Right. But the hygienist is the one really going it's in there and doing the, the dirty work, so to speak, to get rid of those <laughs> germs that can literally kill people. Right. Yeah. So, so right. this is, I, I consider this a, a cultural change in the office, you know, and I've always considered the dental hygienist to be a franchise player. You know, I think, you know, and I've taught in dental school, Dent, dentists don't know how to utilize, I'm going to generalize, they don't know how to utilize their hygienist. You know, it, it's, and it's, and it's, right it's, it's, it's an educational <laughs> thing, yeah. you know, it's not their fault, they don't do no, it on purpose, absolutely. they I just totally don't know their potential. Mm -hmm. And so part of the training, you know, which I'm designing, uh, trust me, the hygienist is golden, okay, because. The, on the flip side is the hygienist doesn't always know their potential either. Right, right. Because this is, I mean, you have 200 plus thousand hygienists in North America. Right. And, we not this message is not to everyone right. at this point like n people don't have not heard oral systemic actually used in a way that they could repeat it to a patient so, in an intelligent way right yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for doing this podcast because yeah. it's extremely <laughs> yeah. important information that's still the number one killer out there is heart attack the number one cause of disability is stroke and one of the critical elements to take those two off the top of the billboard is good oral health right. right you have to maintain excellent oral and health i i've actually been called like told i've been fear-mongering by saying yeah you're yeah. You, you this if you don't get this under control these are the things that could happen right and they're like you can't say that it's a correlation yeah. you can't right. say that you can't yeah. say that so well, this you can is say it now huge, you can say it now <laughs> yeah this is huge yeah but one caveat there our paper is clear it has to be the high risk periodontal pathogens and we define those certainly they may evolve over time and we also know strains within each of those are important as well but that's PG, FN, TD, TF, and AA. Those and are so the five high-risk So if we high say pigeonvalis, right. actinomycetes, right. comitans, right. all yeah. of that kind of stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. That's, that's what we're looking at. The enunciation. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's a few of them. <laughs> that, yeah. Yeah. A few of them might still and give a tongue tie. And they need to be objectively measured, and that can be done with point testing, with the Hain test or oral vita, or it can be done with salivary testing through oral DNA but when we send one of our patients we're concerned about because they have inflammation and there are lots of reasons you can have inflammation and we're looking we're saying golly everything I can control looks like it's okay it's right. probably in the mouth when I send them to my dental colleague I expect them to do the objective testing to look for those pathogens and if they're present they need to be managed and eradicated right so, and so, so how do you manage that? So, so there are three components and what I call in support of the Baildonine method for the, for the dental office, okay? And so the first one is the bacterial assessment, okay, the oral DNA. And like I said, I like to start with the microscope just from an educational. I have a process where I take the patient through. You know, I think if you start the conversation with oral DNA, it's, it's a little obscure, and I, and I want to make sure people understand why. When they see stuff, they're more than likely to kind of follow your path. So I'm, I'm really big on the education and bringing the patient along, okay? The second component, which is a screening component, is the sleep apnea. You know, that's a very, sleep yeah. apnea is a driver. It's one of the root causes in the Baildonine method. And, and it's very easy to screen with, you know, in the office, okay? Whether or not Malipetis you choose. Malapetes, classification, <clears throat> yeah. things like that. Yeah, so it's I mean, you don't have things. to necessarily, you know, go learn to treat it, but just to screen it, mm -hmm. okay? Um, but it also opens up a whole other opportunity if a dentist wanted to get involved in sleep apnea treating, you now here's a rationale for doing it, okay? Right. The third component, which is pretty obscure, and is, is endodontic infections. And what we're talking about is um, root canals that have, you know, that residual mm -hmm. little thing that doesn't yeah. resolve. You know, Dr. Bale and I are, are in agreement that these are particularly dangerous, um, and, and, I, and so that's one of the things. So those are the three things. If Dr. Bale sent a patient to me, he's going to want a very thorough evaluation now okay let's say someone has pathogens above threshold what next okay that's the next conversation and so since since our audience are, are hygienists here what are we talking about is this traditional 
someone asked me in a previous podcast, and it was a it was a great question. So are we talking about you know traditional you know non surgical para? And I said I said there is no such thing. Okay, as long as um, we're using ultrasonics with water, we're not understanding uh, you know <laughs> we're not understanding what we're you know these pathogens and how to kill them. Okay, so so that's part of what I'm wanting to do is to, is to create an antimicrobial standard. I think lasers are, are, are showing huge, okay. a huge potential, LANAP, and, e, and even just laser disinfections, you know, with the mm -hmm. ones that the hygienists can do. Yeah. All of these things, you know, we're not talking about eradicating, we're talking about bringing biofilms, you know, biofilms are a, a living, breathing thing, bringing them into balance. They're, they're the, the, what they do, the pathogens just kind of throw them out of kilter, right. everything in the mouth, and, and you want to bring them, that biofilm, back into balance. And so, so I don't think there's really a standard of care, you know, and, and I want to be a part of that. And, and so with not. the Productive Dentist Academy and Dr. Bruce Baird probably has as much LANAP experience as anybody. And so I'm really anxious to getting with mm -hmm. him specifically about the laser because, you know, lasers are, are extremely efficient. You know, there isn't any question about that. But so, so the conversations that we have to have are antimicrobials. And then we also have to have the conversation about antibiotics. And I have been from the beginning very conservative about antibiotics. And now, now what we're learning about the gut, you know, yeah, you just don't, you just don't hand huge. out uh, metrodiazole like with like, like popcorn. Okay? Right. And, and can you cure periodontal disease with that? Yeah, but you can do a heck of a lot of other things other too. Things, yes, okay. Yes. So one of the things is there's a new um, an antibiotic rinse. Out of a company in, in Canada that uh, Oral Vital, yep, and they have good. a compounded rinse. I, I like their thinking mm -hmm. that you know let's rinse and spit and and still have the effectiveness. But but the most important thing is I approach things. Now this is me personally. This is my personal opinion. I approach things incrementally, meaning I, I save big guns for later because I find. Let's just start with gingivitis. You know, most of this is very easy to treat. Okay, they're very, you know, I, I don't know what percentage I would put cases where you just get perplexed and you've got good compliance yeah. and you're not making, but it's not a lot of patients, okay? So, so why not start with, you know, just more standardized treatment? You know, we can talk about baking soda, the most standard thing, okay? And, and, yeah, and, and how and, we neutralize that. Yeah, and, and, that. and, you know, and then, <clears throat> and then treatment is always modulated, meaning we're measuring. And so with the microscope, since that's an inexpensive test, I can be testing a patient at every, I can look at that biofilm mm -hmm. at every appointment, mm -hmm. okay? And then I know, are they progressing? So I can pick and choose, like let's say I take a baseline oral DNA, I can say, and it's six or eight weeks, I said, this looks like a good time to take that test because that test costs money, mm -hmm. okay? Right, right. And that's the message because I, I know that dentists um, are concerned about implementing these tests. And so I'm trying to create just a very rational, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a very logical guy. And, and, and I think about what things cost in, in my patient's experience. I just want everybody to, to get this level of care, okay? So, so as we're progressing, um, um, you know, you might change, you know, modulation of treatment means we change according to what we see. Okay. Right. So does this patient need a water pick? Is this patient using interdental stimulators? What's the antimicrobial? What's the dentifrist? Do they need this? You know, that. And Meeting them where they're at, it, what they're needing. It's personalized. You know, he, he used the word, I love precision medicine. This is like, you know, personalized dental care. It's precision. You know, everyone's, everyone's different. Everyone has mm -hmm. different challenges depending upon the restorations that are in their mouth. Some people have none. Some of them have bridges, implants. I mean, it's just, it's a whole potpourri. Mm -hmm. So everyone is different. So this this might take you a little more time than the average, you Absolutely. know, than the average yeah. visit. Okay. Troubleshooting. And, and yeah. But once again, we're talking about a, a value system. It's cultural. The, the hygienist is in such a position to educate. You create the whole environment with your whole team, this whole thing of, of a healthy environment, all your literature and everything. Th this is a good story. So when I, when I went to that first AOSH meeting and we had the breakout, <clears throat> I had a very specific goal because I had some questions about what this whole thing was. I did not seek out doctors. I sought every hygienist that really? was there. That's who I sought out. And I wanted to know, tell me about what you think about this oral systemic. And the stories that I heard about <laughs> changing their careers, you know, because dental hygiene can, can get monotonous. Sure. You know, just oh, absolutely. Doing this. And, and the stories, and, the, and I just, I came away and I said, okay, I, I get this. This is real. Um, this is this is changing 
the profession of hygiene because now they're mm -hmm. engaged in, in life-saving treatment. Right. Okay, that's a game changer. Dr. Dr. Bale's research is a game changer. Mm -hmm. There are just many, many things in the universe that are all coming together to a focal point right now that, that we're, we're about to really make some significant changes in healthcare. Yeah, we're at a tipping point. Yeah, no it's question exciting. about Goodness. it. Yeah. And you're right there with us. You're yeah. helping to launch, <laughs> tip it over. So. Yeah. yeah. So there was one thing that, and I'm not sure if it was you, but somebody on the stage at AOSH said, and I think that this probably could speak volumes to a lot of hygienists that are seeing. Um, so you have a 24 year old with just chronic gingivitis. Right. Or, you know, here or there, but it's, it's, every single time you see them. You've seen them since they were kids. You don't know their genetic predisposition. Right. And if you continue to let that happen and you see the bleeding and you don't make efforts to figure out how to make that right. No, for sure. You don't know if you're setting them up for oh. heart disease later on. Yeah, no question. You right. don't know if it's the bee sting and you, it's introduced multiple times and now you have this anaphylactic shock. Like you don't right. know if that chronic inflammation being introduced consistently in that Right. way it's going to create an issue later on right and so you have these these children these teenagers these young adults and we're just kind of letting them slide by right um i think someone no. did a srp on a 10 year old the other day Eight, 10. yeah i'm happy yeah. to hear you bring that up and i haven't talked about it in any of the podcasts so far Ooh today we're the first ones in. yeah <laughs> but you're absolutely right and it goes back to the paper that we just published and the three elements necessary to cause arterial disease and what most medical providers really don't know and certainly dental providers aren't usually going to know it either the first step in the formation of cholesterol buildup in the wall of the artery is the trapping of those cholesterol particles as they seep through the endothelium because the vast majority of those particles are so small that they'll go through the endothelium by a process we call transcytosis. So you don't have to have inflammation in the endothelium to have the cholesterol particles go through. That was shown in a study five years ago. The vast majority of them go right through, even in a healthy endothelium. But they usually just go through the intima into the media. They go through the media. They go through the adventitial layer and out the other side and get caught in the venous and lymphatic system and recirculate it. So to start the whole process, they have to get stuck in the intima. And what's going to stick them are proteoglycans. One of the things that's going to enrich that intima with this Velcro, so to speak, is PG can do that by transforming those contractile smooth muscle cells in the media into the migratory secretory smooth muscle cells. So think about it. What's one of the most important things to do as a child or a young adult? Absolutely make sure you do not have any PG. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you're setting yourself up to start forming all sorts of disease right. in the wall of your arteries. So you're absolutely and, spot on. And, and this opens up a, a couple points on this conversation. One of them, genetic testing. Whenever, whenever you're scratching your head and things are not adding up, you know, I, I think that's when you definitely. I mean, I don't think it's something you do as a routine. But if you ever have any question and something doesn't doesn't seem to be working right, that's an important component. The other part of the thing that I'm super passionate about that that we leave out of the conversation is the transmissibility. Okay, the, you know, familial, how, how, you know, how, how did you get your biofilm to start with? It's from your mother, okay? That's, Is that's it called an STD that, now? Yes, I, I, I don't like that, so I, I've heard that <laughs> yeah. to me, and, and, and I kind of, I kind of. It's a very uh, shocking way to man, say it. Yeah, it. Just viscerally, I didn't like it, yeah. okay? <laughs> it just felt um, wrong. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 there was something wrong about it, and, and believe me, I'm, I'm not gonna use that term, but, <laughs> but, but transmissibility is yeah. important, and I've seen familial oral DNA where husband and wife and child had the same oral DNA, okay? So once again, if you're ever treating any patient and, and you're not, things are not going, and like I said, I think 80% of the time, things just go okay. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have compliance, things go down a straight path. 
But then you have that percentage where you just kind of scratch your head and say something's going on. You have to, if you haven't already had it, you have to immediately have the transmissibility conversation. Hey, I need to see your partner. I need to see your kids uh, because you're not making progress. You're getting reinfected, re-inoculated, and, and we don't have that conversation in dentistry. It's a right. hard conversation. Right. It is. No, you're yeah. exactly right, Tom. And one thing on that subject, that you would agree, certainly, but you, we don't like to talk about it much, but we've had a case where they, they couldn't clear it up, and it turned out the person was kissing their dog, yes. and the dog <laughs> yes. the dog had the yes. pathogen. And that's well documented. So, I mean, that's oh well my documented. Gosh. So you got to yeah. keep that in mind, too. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I, so I, I, I it's had really that transmission through love. Yeah. Right? Through that's love. A, yeah. Yeah. I like that yeah. a lot better yeah. than, than that an STD. STD. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. So this is definitely going to be more of a team approach. No question. It's a cultural. It's that the, yeah. the, you're going to change Absolutely. the culture of your team. So yeah. what suggestions? Because they're going to be hygienists that are stuck. They, right. They're, they're they're not going to be able to get their dentist or their leader right. or their manager or who, wherever they're at right. on board with this yeah. for whatever reason, right. sadly. Um, what is it? I mean, so you got oral DNA, you got your salivary testing, you got all these things, but what is something if you don't have access, if that is just not going to happen in your office, but right. you're a hygienist that wants to make a difference, yeah. which granted I say you should leave, but sometimes you just feel stuck. Like you want to stay with those patients and make them healthy. Yeah. Let me what? say one thing mm -hmm. real quickly on that subject, because I would think that paper that we just had you published should influence some of these dentists who haven't been on board before. Now that it's published that it's actually causal yeah and not just associated so the first thing i would recommend that hygienist do is make sure the dentist reads that paper and it should change their tune on what they're thinking but but so it, you know if it, but if a dentist doesn't too. have a value system <laughs> yeah. then values a yes. hygienist and a hygienist is a tooth polisher to them yeah you know and and you're not and you're not capable of making a job change because i'm going to say you need a new home okay yeah. i mean right, if, if you right. really can't get through to the doctor but you're really inspired by this, you know, um, my advice would be in, in absence of doing, you know, the ideal treatment right. was just become really knowledgeable about the uses of antimicrobials and, and, and how antimicrobials. And one of the things that Dr. Kais at the very beginning, you know, his thing was, was baking soda and hydrogen peroxide and he was criticized because it was too simple. Um, and, and baking soda is an excellent dentifrice. And so, so if someone was to come day. to me and say, you know, I have no money, I can't do anything. I said, can you afford baking soda and some diluted bleach? Okay, that costs nothing. And I'm, I'm gonna tell you something, I can cure 90% of periodontal disease with baking soda and diluted bleach. I don't recommend you doing that, <laughs> but, but you asked me a question. But if you're desperate. But you, when you asked me a question, caught. if I'm on a desert island and I'm not have access to all my stuff, I want baking soda and and some bleach that I can get. Well, actually, I have to tell you, you know, I've been doing it for a year now, and my, I go every three months. Cause obviously, I can't afford to have a heart attack or stroke. Right. right? right. <laughs> so right. I make sure my mouth is okay. Right. But I started putting in one cc right. of Clorox right. per mm -hmm. half cup of water in my water pick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so my water pick holds a cup of water, so I put in two cc's of Clorox. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the and, first time I went in for a checkup after doing that, and I've been doing it about two months at that point, the hygienist checks me over, and they do a thorough job. She steps back. She looks at me. She says, you've been doing anything different? Yeah. And I said, well, why do you ask? She said, I've never seen your gums look so yeah. healthy. That one <laughs> yeah. four-millimeter pocket you've had for several years is gone. gone. Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. Now, see that that's a <laughs> now from my experience, and I, and I will tell you that because that does work very. When you, I'm very reluctant to recommend that to a patient I don't know. That you can, I mean, yeah. that's not something you want to do routinely. People can abuse but things. That, but, More is better. But that's why they'll just be rinsing with full bleach. Right. But I, but I'm very big on <laughs> sodium hypochlorite. That's why I use the, the carry free treatment rinse because that is sodium hypochlorite, and I can kind of get around saying, you know, you could just use bleach. <laughs> but, I, but I don't want people to freak out over that. I know. But but sodium hypochlorite is is awesome okay baking soda is awesome so so did that kind of answer it your does. question so it does. so if, if the hygienist says you know i just need to take this into my own hands i'm in an environment that doesn't support me uh but you know what i'm going to do i'm going to just become well versed in in 
in recommending things that are antimicrobial. See, that's one of the problems is that people are doing things on a daily basis that are not supportive to, bi- to healthy biofilms. They're just using over-the-counter products that aren't mm-hmm. strong enough. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They don't use techniques that are, you know, I'm, I'm one that I, I love the soft picks and the interdental. Thing. I don't like flossing as much, and I don't think it's as, a, as efficient. Um, we talk about the water pick, you know. Um, these are th- this book is about empowering the consumer this is there's a chapter in there on my one minute protocol to disinfect your mouth i like the word for a hygienist use the word disinfection <clears throat> because when i lecture i say every housewife knows that a cutting board in the kitchen has to be disinfected so she doesn't poison her family why are we not instead of using the word srp why don't we say i'm going to do a, i'm going to do a complete oral disinfection yeah. And then all of a sudden they're term. going, oh, you mean there's like germs and stuff that <laughs> you, you have can to catch? Disinfect. We, you know, we need to change. We need to change a lot of things. Yeah. Okay. So I, I like I like my hygienist to use the word disinfection. I like the term biofilm because I want them to know that that stuff on their teeth is alive. Okay. It's not plaque. It's a biofilm. Okay. It's so those are, so those are some of they're just subtle changes mm-hmm. that when I talk about culturally, that's what I'm talking about. Subtle little changes in in the operating procedure that set the stage of maintaining a healthy biofilm because that's the business that ultimately I want you people to be in. You are, you're, a, you're gonna help support and maintain healthy biofilms. All right. And then we've taken 50% of the, of the risk, the heart attack risk off the table. Yeah. And so Huge. if you had to, because there's a lot of contra, uh, co- um, people saying that the numbers are skewed for perio, and periodontal disease and who suffers from it right <clears throat> where where do you fall you know is it 50 game? is it 70 is it you know it, it what do you see on a daily basis i mean you know do a papillary bleeding score and propio it's everybody that's a actually a good point that i think we'll bring up in our intro is what that actually is a papillary bleeding score but i well for instance andrew and i come from very different backgrounds right um he works in a an office that promotes health and wellness and mm-hmm. they they keep their patients in check so his, right his, what he sees is going to be very different right. than than um, the, the average population our recall patients will yeah be. yeah no, we're not talking about a recall we're just yeah. talking about a ra- you just take a random group of 100 people off the street how many people would bleed right mm, it would 70 80 oh, percent right yeah <laughs> or everybody so. yeah and so that's the whole thing you know you, you use the word bloody profi what we have that's the other cultural change bleeding is bad Bleeding is really bad. Bleeding is an it's open. Not a little bleeding. Any you have bleeding. Any bleeding <laughs> is an open communication for those pathogens directly into the bloodstream. Yeah, it is bleeding. Is bleeding. It, is bleeding, bleeding is bleeding. If yeah. it's pinpoint so, or if it's right. like it, a stuck. Pig. And so now you know, and, and I think you see see what I'm talking about when I talk when I talk about the change. It's it's these changes are um, they're they're just cultural how you approach things. We're used to think that, oh, they're bleeding just a little. It's like, no, there's a no, it's a little pregnant. Yeah. It's not, right? know, there's no such thing. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah. we we're, we don't want to take all your time because okay. we know that it's lunchtime as well <laughs> and we all want to eat. But what? let's first tell how hygienists can get involved. Like, so let's, they, they're they going to sell this to their sure. office. Like, okay. where do they start? Right. What is this? Where do we find you? Right. All of those wonderful so, details. So, I think the best thing for an office to do is to go to the bail donate preceptorship. Okay, he has a two two day preceptorship twice a year, and and that's where people will will see the science. Okay, fired up. yeah, fired <laughs> they're up. they're going to come back and know that man. <laughs> yeah. They are they they they're healthcare providers. I mean, they're they're yeah. going to save lives. And then the course that I've created, which is which is both online and then we're going to be doing some live stuff with Productive Dental Academy, um, and, and that is. The, the technical, the protocol for the dentist to really, how do we do this? And so as you can see, I'm not, not only talking about testing, I'm talking about scripting, words to use. It's, you know, it's, it's soup to nuts. I mean, it's yeah. the whole thing, okay? And, and, and those are the two steps that I think would really bring somebody into the loop of saying, um, yeah, this makes completely sense to change, to change uh, the culture of our practice and let's get into, into health and wellness. No, absolutely. I agree, Tom. Thanks. And I think one other thing they could do to get a big step back, broad view of our bail donine method is to read our book, Beat the Heart Attack Gene. It was 
published through an arm of Wiley Publishing that's been extremely well received around the country and also to some degree internationally. It was written for the public, but it has a lot of science in it. We have over 50 pages of references oh, in wow. the book. Wow. But we, we, brought on a, <laughs> we brought on a co-author, Lisa collier Cool, to actually write it because she's won the equivalent of the Pulitzer Prize for healthcare writing to the public. Oh my gosh. So she was able to translate a lot yeah. of what we were saying into language that the public can understand. So certainly the hygienists would easily understand it. But that would give them a big, broad overview of her method. And obviously the oral systemic connection mm -hmm. is in the book. So I think that book would be real helpful as well. I think so, too. Yeah, and, and I have a website. I have a personal website. It's, it's TomLarkin.com my consumer book and the oral system which is course. called i'm free no yes. cavities no gum disease yeah and that it kind of tells the story and it's it's for the consumer and um yeah let's see and then my email is uh, tom at tom .com. thank you for that somebody wanted to reach out to me there and uh you know i, I think i think this whole event this weekend has been has been incredible and, and i know dr <laughs> bell it's been <laughs> it's just kind of like looking at it we, we need to we need this equivalent in the medical community you know he because yeah, he needs absolutely. to he needs to find the young physicians yeah. who yeah. want to get in get in yeah. fire and so we're absolutely. going to be thinking a lot about how how we can better use this medium and we really appreciate what you're doing thank you you know and the number of yeah. countries in the audience that you've created because like i said i we both hold the highest respect for the hygienist because we know the role that you play and we you know yeah. we obviously value saving it. lives yeah, yeah it's it's great. And so for much. a force of <laughs> 200 awesome. plus thousand yeah that, that can make a difference yeah, yeah. and, and you're going to change yeah. some careers okay Let's hope because so. you're going to inspire yeah. people to say wow there's another way to do this i got to go track down yeah. how to how to make my life better yes so thank Absolutely. you for thank you for facilitating no, thank that. you for this thank time this because this is just so valuable. This has to be like so round good. one, though. We got to have. We got to <laughs> do know. this. Again. Right. There's so many more questions Seriously. and so many yeah. more things yes. we have. But yeah. Yes. And then our website. Will you be able to get that? Please. Absolutely. Baldenine.com. Right? Yeah. It's mm -hmm. www. Bale, B A L E. Then my partner's last name, Donine, D O N E E N. dot com. And we've got tons of information on that website. Certainly welcome anyone who wants to come to our course. I'd love to have them there. Yes. And we'll put all this in our little show notes, too, so people can just, like, click on it and then go right to your website or yes. your email addresses or whatever, too. Yeah, great. So. Well, thank you, guys. Well, thank you very thank much. You so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Listeners, I want to tell you a story. A story I found on the web, which makes this Scaling the Web with Andrew. All right. So, for this week in Scaling the Web with Andrew... I have something special for you. I have a website. It is onestop.globaltimes.cn slash seeing dash a dash dentist dash in dash China slash or backslash or forward slash. Okay. Anyways, basically what this is, is it is an article um, from Global Times One Stop. All the knowledge you need for life in China. Seeing a dentist in China. <clears throat> Jesus. This is if, I guess, if you just want information, like if you're traveling in China or whatever. It's easy to fall out of habit of going to see a dentist in China, but you should take care of your dental health by at least going for an annual checkup. You don't want to get hit with a really big bill for treatment that could have been avoided if checked earlier. Almost all general hospitals offer dental care services, but China's best dentists are usually found practicing in hospitals affiliated with the stomat stomatology and then in parentheses, medicine relating to the mouth, schools of renowned universities, long queues are pretty much inevitable. So um, one thing I think that's interesting is they talk about going to general hospitals for dental care services. Oh, you mean like dentists Instead of going to a dental office. Dentists and doctors work together? I know, isn't that Tell crazy? Tell me about this And nonsense. then they said, then they said, the best dentists are in the hospitals that are affiliated with the schools of universe, like renowned universities. Um, awesome, right? But long Makes queues are pretty much inevitable. So long, there are going to be long waits. So they go into the cost of dental care in China. Compared with prices Western, 
compared with prices Western country, it probably they fry in in Western countries. The cost of dental care in China is cheap, but it is not usually covered by regular health insurance policies. But do check with your provider. So for here are a couple of procedures, and they have like the average cost, and then what the average cost in the U.S. is. And this is from 2014, so things might have changed since then. Fillings are 200 yuan. What are they? Yuan? Yuan? Whatever. I don't know. 200 of their currency. <laughs> I should know this, and I'm going to feel really stupid for not knowing this. Um, it's on average about $32 for, for a filling. And the, the average cost in the U.S. is 75 to 145 which I'm assuming is the out-of-pocket cost because... That seems low. Fillings are 300 and something dollars, but your insurance will cover the majority of it. Mm. So they'll cover... 80% or so of them. Um, extractions are 13 to $32, where in the U.S. it's 150 to 250 which I'm assuming are non-surgicals because surgicals get a little bit more pricey than that. Implants are $1,600 to $3,200, and the average cost in the U.S. is 4000 Porcelain crown, 96 to $724, which I think is a very big range. <laughs> and um, the average cost... In the U.S. is eight hundred to fifteen hundred, um, which is a little bit high if you're accounting for insurance because usually it's about a thousand to twelve hundred in most places. Then your insurance covers half of it, so you're still on the hook for five to six hundred usually. So I don't really know where they got those prices. And then laser whitening is only eight dollars La- compared to one hundred and eighty dollars. Laser in the US. whitening. Laser whitening. What is that? That's what, it says. what does that mean? Am I out of the loop with that? What does that mean? Nope, I don't know. Okay, good. It means white, whitening with lasers. Okay, now there's also some other things in here about how to find a dentist, how to assess your chosen dentist, which is really funny because it sounds like these are the same things you should be asking your dentist here in the States. Um, the best one I think that you and I would be really happy for is number seven. It says, ask how long the dentist has been practicing mm. and what sorts of continuing education he or she has pursued to keep up with new developments in dentistry. Isn't that great? That is great. And then they have useful Chinese words and phrases. And I'm not even going to try because I'm. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> then at the bottom of it, it has similar posts. And I don't understand how some of these posts are similar, but it says how to use your employer-provided health insurance in China and avoid its pitfalls. So kind of. Um, should I choose an international hospital or a local hospital in China? So again, kind of close. Another article or another post is uh, going for a general medical checkup. Then it goes into, is abortion legal in China? Oh, Then Lord. are there venereal disease and sexually transmitted infection clinics in China? So it kind of goes downhill after wow. a little bit so, or some of these posts. But yeah. So anyways, that's an f- interesting website that I found on the on web. On the web while you were scaling it. Good job. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> It's about that time. Grab your blanket and a glass of wine. It's story time with Michelle. Story time with Michelle is brought to you by Wine Awesomeness. Wine Awesomeness provides a unique way to explore and enjoy wine through customizable subscription options with an emphasis on wine discovery. Each delicious monthly shipment is an editorialized adventure through a theme, trend, educational concept, or a part of the wine world. Whether it's a deep dive into overlooked Eastern European wines, a selection of bottles perfect for your backyard barbecues, or a month devoted to showcasing the work of women winemakers, they've got you. Don't forget to use the coupon code TAIL, that's T-A-L-E, to receive 10% off your order or just go to our Facebook page and click the sign up button. So this week on Storytime with Michelle, I would like to start it off with the glass of wine that I am well, actually, just finished. Almost chugged in a really like, weird way. <laughs> so the wine awesomeness, where you can get your discount, in the box that I had that this month, it's called Survivor Offspring. And can you see that it's like um, a cow and its calf is its label? And I see that it's empty for sure. Andrew, don't judge me. It is empty. I wasn't judging. <laughs> it is a Syrah, Just Pinot, and Cab mix from 2015. Um, I will tell you. Can I ask a question sure, about that? What? 
Those are all red wines. Correct. This is a red wine I am drinking. Okay. Yes. Okay. Is it wrong to mix those types of wines together normally? No, no. There's lots of blends. If you have a good winemaker, so, they're great. If you don't, then yeah, it is wrong. Okay. But this continue on then. You're in Washington too. You, I, you need. I wish you would go. Mm-hmm. So like it's 54 percent Shiraz, Shiraz, 32 uh, percent Pinot, and then 14 uh, percent Cab. So they they can really mix and match in many different ways. But a lot of things are blends. These days, I actually like the blends the most, which kind of sucks because sometimes they're like only a few bottles will be that particular blend and then it's done, donezo, and I don't have it. So this one is called Survivor Offspring, um, where on the back of the bottle it says we have a resident uh, cow who survived a jump from a cattle truck to live on the farm. She has produced several offspring who have all gone looking for greener pastures. This meaty wine bursting with berries and dark fruit pays tribute to one of these spicy calves, which is kind of cute. Um, so it's offspring or survivor offspring. And I'm going to tell you right now, this wine is strong. So strong. Like three sips in, I was like, oh, hello. That was a very quick little buzz there (laughs) out of nowhere. It's a strong, strong blend, that Survivor Offspring. So check out Wine Awesomeness and look for uh, Survivor Offspring because it's, it's really good. But just be ready for it, guys. Just be ready for it. That's all I got to say. All right, let me go to today's... Well, you know, because we had Dr. Bale and Dr. Larkin on um, the podcast for the interview. So I thought I would talk about the, um, the article that Dr. Bale just published, which is high-risk periodontal pathogens contribute to pathogenesis of arth- atherosclerosis. <sighs> Maybe this wasn't the bottle to drink because I feel like there's going to be some big words to say. But it was published in the um, British Medical Journal in um, November 2016. So um, I will say there's been some definite discussion about this. And um, I think people who nitpick research want, they need more. But I think this is a great start, and I really think it's got a lot of uh, food for thought in it. Are you ready, Andrew? I am ready. All right. So, bacteremia with germs from the oral cavity was well documented in a publication in 1954. The landmark study in- indicated systemic spread of oral microbes occurs frequently. The person um, ind- indents, incidents, God, it's not going to be good, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, found was 40% with periodontal cleaning, 35% with dental extractions, 24% with brushing, and up to 17% with just mastication. The spread of these um, oral bacteria throughout the body happens quickly. This results in acute and chronic inflammation, which can be pathological. High-risk periodontal pathogens include the A. actinomycetium comatans, the P. gingivalis, the T. forsythia, and T. denticola, and the F. nucleatum, which I'm not sure if I said that one right. Uh, They are prevalent in periodontitis. These germs enter the systemic circulation directly, and they are also produced, they also produce endotoxins such as the lipopolysaccharides. These endotoxins generate inflammation cytokines, upregulate endothelial adhesion molecules, and induce a pro-thrombotic environment. These actions can favor the formation of arterial disease and can enhance the risk of atherothrombotic event. So using DNA to identify these oral bacteria, several studies have documented their presence with um, atheromia. In 2009, 44 patients underwent uh, coronary endart... Oh my God, y'all. It's going to be bad. Uh, 39 of the subjects had periodontal disease. 36 of the specimens from patients with uh, probing depths were positive for oral pathogens. 
The most common was the P. gingivalis and the A. actinomycenium comatans. The 64% of those um, atheromas had two or more pathogens. You following so far, Andrew? Yeah, because a lot of this we talked about in the interview too. Yes. So it's all familiar. It should, this all should be familiar. It should be so familiar. Far. Okay, so only one of um, the patients with probing depths demonstrated any oral pathogens. In 2011, 42 carotid um, specimens were analyzed for oral pathogen DNA. Every atheroma had at least one pathogen, and many had multiple pathogens. Again, the most common bacteria was the P. gingivalis and the A. actinomycetium comatans. The oral pathogens create bacteremia, and those bacteria, especially the high-risk microbes, are frequent, uh, frequently associated with atherosclerotic lesions. And the American Heart Association stated after extensive review of the literature that probing depths was independently associated with atherosclerotic vascular disease, or ASVD. The relationship was demonstrated with level A evidence. They discussed in their statement several plausible mechanisms by which probing depths could be associated with arterial disease. One explanation involves systemic inflammation, which can occur with periodontitis. This has been documented by increased levels of biomarkers such as high sensitivity, C-reactive protein, tumor necrosis, and interleukin-6. Probe, uh, probing depths has been associated with the stimulation of the in, innate immune system via toll-like receptors. These toll-like receptors can trigger the activation of nuclear factor, which can create increased levels ad, of adhesion molecules stimulating endothelial dysfunction, as well as increased inflammatory cytokines. The possibilities of the LPS uh, and heat shock proteins coming from the probing depth pathogens causing an autoimmune type reaction from your T and B cells. Remember all that from biology? It's coming back to you? No. <laughs> Another potential mechanism discussed was direct arterial damage from the bacteria in the bloodstream. They acknowledge that there are studies showing probing depth therapy has improved bio biomarkers of systemic inflammation and even surrogate indicators of subclinical art arterial disease. However, due to the fact that there is no de definite evidence to support the claim that probing depth decreases cardiovascular events, the AHA, the American Heart Association, went on to comment that probing depths could not be considered casual. So from the clinical perspective, there is a significant difference between being associated with, with and versus being casual of, the, causal of disease. Optimal uh, management of an associated condition may be may not impact the end disease, whereas management of the casual condition could have a favorable effect on the end disease. Since the AHA generated their statement about the relationship of probing depths to um, the a uh, atherosclerotic vascular disease, new evidence has emerged with arguments that Probing death caused by the high-risk pathogens can enhance elements of atherosclerosis pathogenesis triad. It's a lot, right? So what's so funny is that yes. um, back where was I was working at my first office. So this had to have been in like 2006, 2007. We were sending patients to get blood work for C-reactive protein. So this is something, I mean, it's new, but it's not new. Like if you were kind of in the forefront of, uh, I guess, research and just kind of looking at these kind of like your, the systemic side of it, your interleukins, your C-reactive proteins, things like that, um, they've, they've been doing this for a little bit. So I'm going to skip down to the discussion. So probing depth due to high-risk pathogens may facilitate the three critical steps in the pathogenesis of atherosclerotic vascular disease. Therefore, it is reasonable that probing depth due to the high-risk pathogens be considered causal of the ASVD on clinical grounds. Since ASVD is complex multifactorial disease process, probing depths due to high-risk pathogens is a contributory cause. This means such probing depths is neither required nor sufficient for the pathogenesis of ASVD. 
It is necessary to elevate the distinction of probing depth to casual as opposed to simply associated for clinical management purposes. So casual uh, classification requires therapy to mitigate the risk of its effect. In this case, it means probing depths due to the high ri- to these high risk microbes must be treated effectively to reduce th- reduce the risk of ASVD. So they're not, they're saying that you just you have to somehow decrease the probing depths and then maybe there'll be a a decrease in the risk. As it is often the case in science, a new realization creates a list of unsolved issues. In this case, one obvious question is how to objectively identify the pathogens. The definition of probing depths must include a diagnosis of the specific underlying pathogens causing the probing depth. There are numerous studies that have demonstrated the um, cardiovascular um, risk from probing depths. It's driven by the pathogen burden as opposed to only clinical exam findings such as pocket depth, bleeding on probing, and bone loss. The clinical oral health examination is important and must remain an important component of the diagnosis. However, from a CV standpoint, there must be an objective assessment of high-risk pathogen burden as a part of the definition of probing depths, or I'm sorry, periodontal disease. There are several DNA-based oral pathogen tests available to assess high-risk pathogens, which we did have. We're going to have an upcoming guest talking about salivary testing and DNA testing. Um, However, many dentists are not familiar with these tests, and there is a uh, substantial cost involved. Understanding that high-risk periodontal disease pathogens are casual of ASVD places in... um, just very good importance upon our dental colleagues to continue their efforts to develop affordable, reproducible, and objective testing for high-risk periodontal pathogens. An additional substantial issue following the recognition of periodontal disease due to the high-risk pathogens as causal of ASVD is, one, how is it successfully managed, which, God, that's like the never-ending question, There is sparse data addressing the most effective way to manage such disease. One randomized perspective study of 101 patients with periodontal disease tested the effectiveness of scaling and root planing alone versus scaling and root planing plus systemic antibiotics. There were two antibiotic arms, the metronidazole, 400 milligrams three times a day, plus amoxicillin, 500 milligrams three times a day for 14 days. In addition, half of the patients in each of the three arms of therapy rinsed with 0.12% chlorhexidine two times a day for two months. Follow-up testing of the pathogens was concluded at one year. Oh, this is a pretty decent study. The study found there was more effective elimination of high-risk pathogens with the addition of antibiotics and antimicrobial rinse. However, they point out the study might have been underpowered and an and any conclusions should be interpreted with caution. Story of my life with all these studies. Interpret with caution. Uh, One other randomized placebo-controlled clinical trial has been done comparing the effectiveness of SRP alone with SRP with antibiotics, your metronidazole and amoxicillin. The study examined 58 non-smoking type 2 diabetics. They were treated with SRP alone or with metronidazole and amoxicillin three times per day for 14 days. The follow-up DNA evaluation for high-risk pathogens was concluded in one year. The patients treated with antibiotics had greater reduction in three high-risk pathogens, your TF, TD, and PG, so your P. gingivalis. Again, this is a very small study, and results need to be interpreted, interpreted with caution. Issues with management extended beyond simply the initial therapy of high-risk pathogens, but is the most effective manner in which to maintain periodontal health. There is no significant published study we are aware of that addresses the pertinent issue. Studies evaluating management could also need, also need to clarify the percentage of success, the side effects of therapy, the cost of management, and ultimately the return on investment in reducing the mortality and morbidity of ASVD. Currently, there are no large clinical trials generating a definitive answer for the effective management of periodontal disease due to high-risk pathogens. This is a a fertile research ground for our dental colleagues. 
God, if only, if only people could start to do that. Uh, realizing periodontal disease due to high risk pathogens is um, causal, causal of ASVD demands such investigation. It should be clear that one person or one reason the AHA's meta analysis was only able to provide an independent associated association between periodontal disease to ASVD as opposed to a casual relationship is due to the the paucity of studies including pathogen burden and the definition of periodontal disease. This remains a significant issue as studies currently published analyze the relationship between periodontal disease and ASVD. When the component of high-risk pathogens is included in the diagnosis, there is evidence that treatment reduces CV risk. The carotid intermal media thickening, which Dr. Bale talks about, change is a marker of change in CV risk. So what pretty much they're getting at is it's there's a lot of markers. So the pathway is very clear for justifying that periodontal disease due to, due to the high risk pathogens is casual um, of ASVD. So once our and they they kind of finish their thing saying this. Once our healthcare partners in dentistry have identified effective management of this type of periodontal disease, such intervention offers significant potential for reducing the impact of ASVD. So this is the the problem that I think the some very, uh, I don't want to say picky, but people who really read the research with a fine tooth comb saying that they're, they pretty much did kind of like a systemic, systematic review and looked at all these other studies and found that they, you could say that one was causing another because they were finding these bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, I do agree that I think it's still kind of early. It would be nice if we actually saw some trials of some sort, but... I'm a believer. I really do. I, 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 inflammation is inflammation, and I have no doubt that it creates a whole lot of problems throughout the body. So I say if you don't believe, what, her, what father when, does it do? I think also when you hear, like, it, you know, which we just technically just heard in the interview about that pathway you were talking about, he explains it a little bit different of how it goes from the mouth into the you know, the, your yeah. whole system. And I think that, that when you hear it the way Much he better. explains it, rather than, I'm not saying that you didn't do a good job reading all that. But, but this like, is a scientific is so much better, technical it article. The it definitely better. makes it harder to grasp yeah. it in layman's terms, for sure, which is always yeah. my problem. Yeah. And I think a lot of times when, when people explain it in plain words like yeah. he did, I think that there is a lot of inference and I think there is a lot of deductive reasoning that goes into it that maybe the science community does can't really appreciate. So I, I get what you're saying, but you know, we need some, like you were mentioning before, some of these big corporate companies to do some of these studies on large populations. Yep. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, big pharma ain't going to do what? it because God forbid we decrease blood pressure pills and cholesterol pills. So somebody else has to throw some money at it and get some actual really good studies. But I, I agree. This, this is a, it's a very rich area that you could really throw some time and do some really good research studies. I think it would be really very interesting. So very science-heavy podcast that we have today. It's kind of like Tracy Butler's too. Yeah, yeah. I, it, but it, again, it wasn't too high level. It wasn't like, it wasn't to a level where you couldn't comprehend what they were saying. It's, it does, you know, you do have to do some callbacks to your, you know, chemistry, biology, microbiology courses yep. to understand all these different things. But I mean, listen to it once or twice through and it makes a lot of sense. It really does. Um, I directed a few people to our podcast on Facebook uh, the last few days because everybody was talking about things that you could do outside of the op and why getting a bachelor's degree or going just kind of higher education would be important. So maybe one day you guys, if you play your cards right, you could be one of these researchers and doing these articles and being a part of this, this movement between and dentistry. And Michelle can read your articles on Yeah, on, on Storytime with Michelle after I've drank too much <laughs> of wine. 
Like you mentioned, the bottle is gone. I didn't do that all today. <laughs> Just half. Right. No, no, no judgment. <laughs> sure. Good podcast, right. though. Great episode. Yep. Everybody have a great week. Take care, everyone. Bye, y'all. Can I talk while you listen? Or do you need a moment? Yeah, of course. I mean, I'll pretend to listen, but go ahead. I hate that when I write your name in text messages, it only does one L as default. Oh, I break your phone right now. With a little with the little thing, like, you know, like, oh, you don't oh, have it. Yeah, um, yeah. You know what, Galaxy, yeah. do this swiping thing? Yeah. Oh, I love Angie so much. Are you texting her? Hmm. I don't even have Angie Stone's number. Oh, yeah. Angie and I, like, we go way back. Oh, wow. To Chicago, Chicago Midwinter oh, yeah. last year. You're welcome for that <laughs> introduction. Dude, I... You know, I don't know. Like we, like we hit it off like really well. That's great. Hold on, though. I got another How text do you not? from Karen Siebert. Oh God, look at you! Um, my way to Missoula to work this in the office this week right tomorrow now. after eleven a.m. Time is fine. This is honestly, this happens often. <laughs> like that's. I'm sorry that people don't like you, but yeah, whatever. They don't. They really don't. <laughs> it is.